you so much, Trisha. Thank you, Trisha. And thank you so much, Alicia, for being our Zoom helper. Thank you, Ernest, our deaf interpreter. Um, give, your, give yourselves a round of applause, please, for just taking time to be here, to prioritize yourself, to come and hear what I have to say. <laughs> I, have, I really appreciate it. So thank you and give yourselves a round of applause. I wanna greet you all from the bottom of my heart, um, our community, our funders, our supporters. I'm Carrie Jordan. I'm the executive director for The Carpentry. I truly hope that you enjoyed the first week of Carpentry Con and have been able to meet someone new, to learn something new and to engage with the community in accessible ways. Thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to deliver this keynote today. It's gonna be a little bit different than some of the other keynotes that I've given, some of the other talks that I've given over the years. And here's why. As stewards of the Carpentry's vision and values, you, our community, you taught over 330 workshops for the Carpentries last year, helping novices and others improve their research practices and learn foundational coding skills. You joined our trainer and maintainer communities and helped us improve these communities from a governance and accessibility perspective. As a core team and community, we've improved transparency in how we operate and ensured that each community member can engage no matter who you are or how you identify. We've built a globally diverse core team. We've pursued funding opportunities. We've explored ways to manage and diversify our revenue. We've improved our brand recognition while listening to our local community leaders to understand their pain points in organizing Carpentry's activities at the local level. One of our biggest accomplishments was the Carpentry's first Carpentry Connect in South Africa that took place virtually. We took those lessons learned and used them to make Carpentry Con even more accessible. I couldn't help but cry. You have It's on video. I'm sure it's on our YouTube channel now. <laughs> I couldn't help but cry at the opening event to see live closed captioning and sign language interpreters. It was such a dream come true. We've reactivated our curriculum advisory committees. These advisors are a key component in ensuring the Carpentry's curricula are up to date and effective. It's been wonderful to see the number and caliber of lessons in our incubator and the path forward for that program includes ensuring our community members receive credit for creating high quality lessons. Our collaborative lesson development training is moving towards its beta phase. And we look forward to building out that program similar to instructor training. Our lesson infrastructure is more accessible than it's ever been. And we look forward to realizing the beta phase of the Carpentry's workbench in the coming months with improved documentation to ensure lesson maintainers have the easiest time managing their lesson repositories. We released a new pricing structure with increased flexibility for our membership offerings, allowing members to create service packages that will best serve their needs. We also introduced geographically tiered pricing, which will enable us to better serve organizations outside high income countries. We started a financial support program to offer support for organizations who are unable to pay our standard fees, irrespective of their location. We've automated several internal workflows and membership, instructor training, and workshops to improve how information is communicated and give instructors an easier time to sign up to teach workshops. The Carpentries helped build knowledge by creating a conducive environment for the exchange of skills, perspectives, and experiences that empower people 
and enable them to reach their full potential. This year, we onboarded the largest and most globally and linguistically diverse cohort of trainers to date. And we've been intentional in our approach to supporting workshops, reducing the number of workshops we offer per week to ensure our instructors have time to prepare. We are proud to have made online workshops permanent, but also thrilled to share that we're piloting in-person workshops at several locations. Act openly. Empower one another. Value all contributions. Always learning. Inclusive of all. People first. Access for all. Community collaboration. Strength through diversity. These are the nine core values of the Carpentries. And in the last few minutes, I've given you only a few examples of the contributions that we've made in line with our values. Listing out all of these contributions makes me wonder, is our community tired? <laughs> are you exhausted? Are you practicing self-care? The importance of having self-care resources readily available will help mitigate the impact of the uncertainty and stressors we deal with daily as we work to collaborate and contribute to the Carpentry's mission. During our time together here, I'll be inviting you to identify and connect with the good things in your life by creating joy lists. We'll start with a few definitions and then I'll lead you through a few exercises to create joy lists of your own. So take a moment to grab something to write with, grab your favorite beverage, and let's get comfortable as we head into creating our joy list. The title of my talk is Radical Self-Care. You may be wondering what the word radical means and why I chose it. Radical describes a change in the fundamental nature of a thing. It also describes advocacy and supporting social change. As I reflected and prepared for this keynote, I was reminded that all around us, there's a sense of uncertainty and overwhelm. At home, at work, in the markets, at the airports, everywhere I turn, I notice us juggling all the things at the same time and consistently deprioritizing our mental, physical, and emotional health. I'm guilty of it. And I see a lot of core team members and they can tell you I'm guilty of it. <laughs> I have been known to work a full day on my day off. So I had to look in the mirror and ask myself, why, why, why is it so easy to give my all to my work and the causes that are important to me. But when it comes to working on myself, it can be a bit of a struggle. I go back to the definition of radical. Radical describes a change in the fundamental nature of a thing. Well, what do we believe fundamentally about self-care? Audrey Lord is everything. <laughs> She's a feminist, a librarian, and a civil rights activist. And one of my favorite quotes from Ms. Lord is, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. When you consider the, the term self-care, what comes to mind? I want you to put it in the chat. When you hear self-care, what does it mean to you? What's the first thing you think of? Maintenance, rest. Go to the doctor, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Prioritizing self, putting me first. Sleep, come on, Megan. <laughs> Those are some great examples. 
Now, most see self-care as treating yourself to something, pampering yourself, putting your own needs ahead of others, or following a prescriptive list of behaviors or engaging in solo activities. If that's how you thought about self-care until now, it's time to get radical. We're gonna make a fundamental shift in your thinking about self-care. Cognitive behavioral therapists tell us that self-care is not a commercialized way of pampering yourself or withdrawing from the world. Thinking of it that way, you'll overlook forms of self-care that are easily accessible and potentially very helpful. Self-care is a multi-dimensional process of purposefully engaging in strategies that promote your health and well-being. It is a conscious act to promote your own physical, mental, and emotional health. Think of it as a priority and not a luxury. Since self-care is about you, you will determine what your self-care plan will include. This can be super overwhelming. So I'm gonna ease your mind and give you an example. This is an example of a joy list. There are times when work is demanding, family is challenging, and I personally barely have time to cook a healthy meal for myself. Sometimes I feel like I only have five minutes to do something self-care related. What on earth can I do in five minutes? And that's when I pull out my joy list. A joy list is a tool that you can use to connect with the good things in your life. I like to separate my joy list by blocks of time. For example, if I have 10 minutes or less, what can I do to connect with the good things in my life? What if I had one hour? What about a full day? We're gonna take some time right now for you to create your joy list. And afterwards, I'll show you my joy list and maybe it'll give you some ideas. So let's get started. Grab something to write with and create a table with three columns. In the first column, column we will write ways to connect with the good in your life that can be accomplished in 10 minutes or less. In the second column, one hour. And in the third column, one day. Now, alternatively, you could write your ideas on individual sticky notes or pieces of paper and put them in a jar. I'm gonna give you one minute right now to write as many ways that you can connect with the good things in your life in 10 minutes or less. The timer has been set. You have 10 seconds. Beautiful, keep writing if you're not finished. <laughs> now, you have one hour. How can you connect with the good things in your life 
in one hour, what will you put on your joy list? I'll give you one minute to write your ideas down in the one hour column, starting now. You have 15 seconds. It's not enough time, I know. (laughs) Lastly, you have a day. Now a day can be anywhere between eight and 24 hours you choose. What can you do to connect with the good things in your life if you had a day? You have one minute to brainstorm and write your ideas down on your joy list in the day column. You have 10 seconds. Wonderful. Keep writing if you haven't finished. So how did that feel? How did that feel? We're gonna chat soon. And I want to hear all about the experience, how it felt for you to just take time to think about some of the things that you can do to connect with the beautiful, joyful things in your life. But before we do, I wanna show you my joy list. (laughs) So some of my favorite things on this list are meditating using my favorite meditation app, singing karaoke on a Saturday night. There is a place in Orlando where I live called Rising Star and they have live band karaoke. It's one of my favorite things to do. (laughs) Eating lunch with friends at my favorite Indian restaurant. I, I love chicken tikka masala with garlic naan. It's my favorite. Practicing Spanish using the Duolingo app is one of my favorite things to do. FaceTiming my dad. We always end up dancing together um, on FaceTime. These are some of the things that I do to connect with the joyful things that are in my life. Is there anything on my list that's in your list? Tell me in the chat. Sleep. (laughs) Yes, cup of tea, plants and yoga. Walks are always beautiful. Going to the beach, absolutely. Yeah, I don't spend that much time watering my plants. (laughs) Awesome. Yes, I love a good pedicure. We have a lot in common. I love this. Let me circle back to the beginning of my talk and and sort of pull all of this together. There's an ethos 
behind the carpentries movement that cannot be denied. This community continues to manifest itself in ways that are beyond my comprehension. This is my sixth, and sixth year anniversary with this project. I started working with Data Carpentry in August of 2016 when there were six staff members across Data and Software Carpentry. We are now 16 staff members at the Carpentry, soon to be 18. We're supporting thousands of community members globally. The health of this organization and the health of each and every one of our community members is of the utmost importance to me. And that is why I want to leave you with just a few takeaways. You are valued in the Carpentries community. We champion people first, and we truly believe that people, you, are the most important part of our organization and our strongest resource. But you cannot be a resource to the community, to the Carpentries community or the broader open science, open data movement if you do not take care of yourself. Your self-care plan should be tailored to fit your life and your needs. Creating one will help prevent burnout and overwhelm. And I encourage you to prioritize yourself. I'll stop here. I intentionally made this talk short and sweet so that we can have time to talk to one another. I wanna hear what you wrote about in your joy list. I wanna hear what your thoughts are about the work that we're doing as a community. Thank you so much for attending my keynote and enjoy the rest of Carpentry Con. So I think we are taking questions now, is that right? Sure. Applause, applause, thank yep, you. Yep. <laughs> What's on your joy list? Can I start, can I start with the first question? I don't think that's how it's supposed to go. I would love to hear if anyone is interested in raising their hand or um, just unmute yourself. We would love to hear what you, some of the things that you wrote on your joy list and what the process was like for you. I'll share one. For my 10 minute joy list, I put petting my dog because it always makes me feel happier to get some of that dog fur on my face. That's such a great idea. Any other animal lovers? <laughs> Mine was sharing. harassing my cat. <laughs> I know that that's a form of love for you and Joma. <laughs> what else? Spending time with my birds. Oh, wow. Yeah, birds. I know for me, um, one of the nice things about working from home is that uh, my partner also works from home. And so sometimes I just go over to, to his office and just give him a hug. Like, that's all. I'm just, I, I just want to hug and then just, you know, move on with the day. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Tickling my children. Oh, I love that, Shani. What else? <laughs> I had a bird when I was a child and I do remember the bird being very loud and very dirty. <laughs> Anything else you all wanna share? Alicia. Yeah, um, thanks for that presentation, Carrie. It was wonderful. I, I was curious about, um, for me, I, I have these types of tools, but when I get really stressed, it's when I'm most likely to not follow them. Yes. Because <laughs> you just have that chaos going on in your life and you're like, I don't, I just don't have time for anything other than whatever it is. So I was curious if you have any tips um, for really making sure you're focusing on these things at those times when it's most important to. Yes, one of my biggest tips is to have an accountability partner. I would like to be yours, sidebar, so we can meet about that later. <laughs> but yes, one of my biggest tips is to have an accountability partner, someone who just checks in with you, even setting a recurring like 10 minute 
on your calendar for you to call this person or have them call you. We have 10 minutes, grab your joy list and, and do something on it um, because it can be, you're, you're absolutely right. Some days I barely have time to use the bathroom, which is very embarrassing. But again, if you don't prioritize, ultimately you're not going to be able to have clarity when you're working on um, you know, carpentry's programming or in your own personal lives. So I think having an accountability partner is an extremely good tool to help you, um, to help hold you accountable to some of the things on this list and actually blocking out time for that person to check in with you. What, do you all have tips? I'm not an expert. I said that earlier. <laughs> yes, making a joy list is now on Trevor's list. Other questions or questions not only about self care and um, preventing overwhelm and burnout, particularly in our community, but any any of the information that I shared just about the carpentries where we are as an organization. We have present and past executive council members on our call today, so now is a great time to just ask any questions that you have. Colin. I was just wondering, anything we've just talked about, is this going to end up in instructor training? Oh, <laughs> that's such a good question. I can't say because I'm not the boss of instructor training. Um, Karen, <laughs> Karen Word is the director of instructor training. But one, oh, one yeah. challenge we have with in, one challenge we have with instructor training is that there's so much content already. Right, Karen? We have to make space. <laughs> There's so much content already. So maybe we could create some sort of either bonus module or maybe in the actual instructor onboarding, we can talk about strategies for, you know, self-care and preventing burnout. If you all have been, you know, with me over the last few years, you know, I talk about burnout a lot. I talk about proper onboarding a lot. I talk about these things because I believe when you when you truly onboard, someone to a role, give them the tools and help give them strategies um, and tools, you will give them, give them a sense of agency and a sense of responsibility for their sort of self-regulation, right? And so I think if we can either create some sort of bonus module or even a series of community discussions where we all come together and discuss ways to take a step back and take time, um, I think that will be helpful. Self-care carpentry. <laughs> oh my goodness. Other questions. We have about, we have a little less than 20 minutes. So ask all the questions. You know what, Megan, you're absolutely right. So in the chat, Megan says carpentries could probably look into developing a culture or mindset more in the training. And I, I love that because we're, we're an organization that a lot of other projects look to when it comes to creating inclusive environments, when it comes to creating inclusive events, accessible events. Um, even as a, as a staff, as a core team, we talk a lot about the culture that we're building. And so if we can be a, an example for other projects around, you know, this is what a community that prioritizes self-care looks like, I think that would be beautiful. All right, I did my hair and it's just in the way. Okay. <laughs> other questions or comments? Make sure I didn't miss anything. Perhaps the most, perhaps the best impact self care carpentry could have would be to invite people to a two day workshop that is secretly not a real event and instead an excuse to just keep two days of free time. One of my strategies, it truly is blocking out time. I usually look 
ahead one to two months and I just pick a day and I block it. I don't even know what I'm going to do, but I just block it. And then by the time that day comes around, I'm so grateful that I did. <laughs> Gian? Um, yeah, and to that point, one of the things that I do uh, that I've done since since grad school, um, at the end of the day, I just close my laptop and I don't turn it on at all. Uh, that was the pattern that I found myself going through in grad school and it was bringing me a lot of stress. And it was a, I was advised that and it has completely changed um, my, uh, my ability to function. <laughs> mm. uh, so just like even just like noting that like work is work and, and home life is home life, especially in these times when you're working from home, just close that laptop. You know what, that that speaks to Yanetta's comment about, she says, my problem is that I can't tell the difference between my work and my hobbies. And I think that's true of many people in open source. You come into it, you're energized by it, the community, the projects that you're working on, the creativity, and over time, you it can be very blurry, <laughs> the line between, is this my, like, am I, is this my job? Is this my hobby? How do I put this down? That's so true. There was a question about whether we know how the percentage of instructors that are going through burnout. And I want to see if Cher, who is our director of workshops, can shed any light. We haven't done a survey specifically on burnout, but we have um, surveyed instructors about a few different things during the pandemic. Cher, are you... I, I thought I saw her here. Yes, see. I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So as it relates to, and can you repeat the question just so to make sure I'm answering the right part of the question? <laughs> just do you have a do you have any perception of whether our our instructor pool is feeling burnt out? Yeah. So um it's a little bit of a mixture of things. So I do, we do believe that there is a burnout of instructors, you know, being asked to teach so many workshops, which is why one of the things that we did do was limit the amount of workshops we offer in a week. Um, while being able to turn to online workshops, it was great for the workshop organizations um, so that they could offer more workshops across the globe, um, which was great, but it also, you know, in hindsight for us saying yes to that, we also recognize that it is a burnout for our instructors because during the height of the end of the, the pandemic, you know, people didn't have anything to do. So they were, you know, eager to sign up to teach workshops all the time, which is great. But now that we are in this, you know, trying to figure out what the new norm is of balancing, you know, um, trying to go back to in-person things, but still also balancing those who are, you know, may have permanently uh, started being um, online, there's still a, you know, we're trying to balance this. And so we do think that there is a burnout for our instructors of asking them to teach, you know, so many workshops. But on top of that, in addition, we recognize that previously pre-pandemic, our workshops were two, two days. So you really have to think about, you know, I knew if I was teaching with the Carpentries, I had two days um, and maybe three with the travel day because you were traveling to that location. Whereas now, again, because it's online, we've offered um, an opportunity for workshop hosts to, you know, um, separate or spread out over time. So now instead of two full days, it's, oh, maybe I'm going to do four half days or maybe it's going to be two half days this week and two half days next week. And, you know, it's chopping up their week. So there are a lot of different, um, we recognize there's a lot of different scenarios and please know that the workshop admin team and the core team, we recognize all of these things and we wanna make sure that it's transparent that we we recognize that these are some of the um, things that are, are hindering us or, you know, some of the things, some of our roadblocks that we are up against. And we are looking at different scenarios to make sure that, you know, we are offering an amazing service to people around the world to learn data science, but we are also protecting and looking out for our volunteer instructors. 
Thank you so much, Cher. And there are many community members sharing in the chat some of the strategies that they use to separate their work life from home life, such as taking email and Slack notifications off their phone. I, I can't tell you how my life changed when I stopped checking my email at the dinner table on my phone. It's a beautiful life I have now. <laughs> I still have Slack, and it's but I don't have notifications on on the Slack. So normally, and that's that's because our team is global, and I want to make sure I get questions answered for someone who maybe they're you know they're in California or they're in South Africa. I live in Florida, and so I don't want to be a bottleneck. Um, but those are some really good strategies as well. We were talking a lot about instructors, burnout for instructors. What about the other community roles that we have? What are you all hearing um, from the maintainer community, from the trainer community? Is it the same? Is there a sense of, of overwhelm within those uh, community roles? I think that's something I want to look into. So I'll probably connect with the curriculum team to see how we can check on, on our maintainers. Oh, that is a great idea, Karen. That's a great top. That will be a great topic for an upcoming trainer meeting. Thank you. All right. I wanna thank you all so much for taking time to attend my keynote today. As I told you in the beginning, it was gonna be a little bit different. And it's really because the health of the, of the organization has been on my heart for a very long time. And I just wanted to share some of my thoughts around how you can take time for yourself so that you can be an awesome contributor. Um, at the Carpentries, we are working to improve the way we onboard community members in all the, the various roles that you serve in. Um, Alicia's Community Development Program has a lot of work around onboarding, welcome tip sheets, making sure that you're getting the communications that you want to receive instead of all the communications about everything. Um, Cher, who's our director of workshops, will be working on a, a dedicated instructor onboarding to sort of bridge the gap between the checkout process and teaching your first workshop. So there's lots of things that we're trying, but ultimately we cannot do it. We cannot exist without you, without each and every one of you. And I wanna thank you so, so much for all you do in support of our values and support of our mission and our vision. Thank you, it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure. So I think I need to pass it back over to Trisha. Do we have a closeout or was that, was I the, was that the closeout? <laughs> um, we do not have a closeout to my knowledge. Other than okay. we well, in that stopped case, the recording. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well in that case, this talk was supposed to last until 50. I'm giving you eight minutes, go do something on your joy list for 10 minutes or less. Thank you. Good day, everyone.